Good afternoon, guys. Welcome to the final session of the day. My name is Jason Conger, and this is Jeff Muir. Go ahead and introduce, introduce yourself, Jeff. Yeah, I'm Jeff Muir from Citrix Labs in, uh, based out of Sydney, Australia. So all this equipment here that you see, this is uh, Jeff's equipment that came from Citrix Labs in Sydney, Australia. He brought a whole like data center with him to do this session. So the name of this session is FUIT, and I've had some problems people understanding what ITFTW. Any, do you, you know ITFTW? Anybody can guess that? Yeah. IT for the win. So which one are we? FUIT or IT for the win? All right. Again, there's our introduction. So my website, Jeff's website. Jeff hasn't come to the Twitter world yet, so no Twitter handle for Jeff. That might change this weekend. That might change this weekend. Okay, well, hold on while I plug this thing up to see if they're going to crash everything when I get the clicker. Okay. Does this work? Yeah. Forget the clicker. It's not working. Did it? What? Do, do what? What? the red X instead of the I can't see. It's not on my screen here. Is it going to work? Yay, all right. So this is kind of a rehash of what Brian talked about this morning. You know, Today we have desktops and we have Windows running on desktops. And by and large, those desktops are corporately owned, which means we know a lot about those desktops. Normally, there's just a few models of the desktops. We know the power of the desktops, the resolutions, screen sizes, so on and so forth. And we know how to deliver apps to those desktops. We have things like Active Directory, System Center, we have application streaming, Aircom, VMware, Quest, well, now Dell, um, and then Citrix. We know how to do this, right? Pretty easy. Well, now with BYOD, we're losing track on what people are bringing. For the most part, we, you know, for the most part, these things are not corporately owned. Sometimes they are, but, but for the most part, they're not, which means we may or may not know the capabilities of these devices, and the devices are changing rapidly. So we don't have we can't rely on our old methods. So again, like Brian said this morning, we can't just pop some desktop on the thing. It's just not usable. So users are expecting a near native um, experience on their mobile device. So how do we deal with that? So users say an FUIT and going and finding their own ways, or we can be IT for the win and figure out how we can give these users a native experience. So as an IT pro these days, this is what we're dealing with. This is a screenshot taken from Citrix Synergy earlier this year, HTML5, Windows, Mac, Android thing. This is what we have to deal with now. We have to support everything. So how do we do it? Um, well, so Mar, this is the question. So how do we deliver these, uh, the mobile experience and data to the users? Well, there are several different ways we can do this. You can take what you have today and just virtualize it. So whether that's a published app or a published desktop, you can just take that. But as you see on this scale, as user experience goes up, the application and develop it, development effort extends as well. So when I talk about security, I say security is inversely proportional to usability. What that means is as you tighten security, usability goes down. As you lack security, usability um, goes up. Well. The user experience in the application develop, development effort here is directly proportional. I mean, as the user experience goes up, so does, your eff, so does your effort in development. As user experience goes down, which we're right here, the development effort is very low and the user experience is very low as well. But it's an, a strategy you can use. So the next thing, you can rely on your ISV to develop some kind of application. Of course, you don't have much control of that because ISVs are doing what they do. They may or may not fit your use case, and then so you don't have really any control there. You have this kind of hybrid solution with this mobile enterprise app platform. That's kind of a, a hybrid solution, and you're building your own apps, um, <clears throat> but you do have multiple builds per device. And then here's this convergence zone. So what if you could take your existing apps that you have today and mobilize them? Well, Gartner predicts that just on VB6 migrations from 2012 to 2018, There'll be one billion U.S. dollars spent. Of course, by next year, they're supposed to, the VDI market's supposed to be 65 billion. So, take that with a grain of salt. We'll see what happens. 
Okay, so that's a nice introduction to what this session is, but the rest of the session we're really only talking about two things, and that's how we're going to mobilize these apps, and there's two ways that we're going to talk about doing it. First of all, we'll talk about ways you can do it without writing a single line of code, so methods that you can use today. You can just go home to your data center when you get home, do these uh, methods, not much effort at all, makes your user experience a little bit better. And then the coding methods, which there's a lot that you can do with coding that's not quite so much effort. So we won't try to get too much into the coding because this is not a developer session, but we'll, we'll show you some cool things that are going on now. Okay, so the first thing we'll look at are non-coding methods. <clears throat> so if you're talking about non-coding, you're talking about, you have to first talk about the remoting protocols. So you have your you know, RDP remote FX type protocols that can deliver to mobile devices, things like um, EOP, Aircom, um, several different things you can write on top of RDP. Then you have your PCI, uh, PC over IP, which mainly is just VMware. You have your HTML5 remoting protocols, or I guess they're really just inside of HTML5. Uh, remote Spark is a cool one because it will actually do remote app off a uh, terminal server, or RDS. Um, RDP ITAP Mobile, another client for your mobile devices. Um, thin VNC, again, all of these are just HTML5 wraps this, and technically Aircom fits over here as well because they have an HTML5 client as well that wraps RDP. Then you have um, HDX, and I thought I saw, yeah, Brian. Okay, so, so last night I heard, learned from Sean Bass and, uh, and Brian uh, that we have Framehawk. And so I just read up about Framehawk. Framehawk's kind of cool because they're actually looking at the frames on the wire and are allowing you to do some things with your mobile device. Um, from what I understand for the short time that I've heard about them, it's a pretty intensive solution, meaning you're going to hire the company to, to do some of these things for you. Um, Brian Katz, is that a fair assessment? I'm, yeah, sort of. Okay. Sort of? Okay. Your session is tomorrow at 11-ish, right? I have it on the, in the yeah. slide. Go, go to his session to learn some more about that type of stuff. Okay. All right, so anyway, you got to talk about the remoting protocol. So you're really stuck with desktop, and in some cases with HDX and remote Spark, you're talking about application. So what can we do with just the remoting protocols, or I guess with the apps themselves, without writing a single line of code to give you a better mobile experience? Well, first of all, since your user interface is your finger, and your finger is larger than a lot of the buttons, you can make your buttons larger. So, here, it shows an example of Microsoft Excel, and we're making the buttons bigger. And these are really just a set of registry entries. Um, I won't escape out, but you'll notice right here, there's an embedded Word document on this slide. That embedded Word document has several registry entries that will make your buttons bigger on things like the Microsoft Office Suite. So make your buttons bigger, a little bit more touch friendly, no coding involved. Another method that has been done in the past is resizing your application. So this is a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet again, and there are several panes that are just um, drawn out there to match the size, in this case, is the iPhone screen. And so as you go and you kind of, um, what you're doing is you're really thinking of your phone as a viewer for your application. Um, there used to be in receiver, I haven't confirmed whether it's still there, if you do a two finger swipe, it would be called a pane swipe and it would scroll over that many pixels. So if you do two finger swipe, it'd scroll 320 pixels, you're looking at the next, so as you're scrolling through, you're looking at the next pane and the next pane, so kind of faking it out, but still a little bit better, not great, but no programming involved. Now Citrix released something called the Citrix Mobility Pack that you install on Zenapp 6.5. So if you have a Zenapp 6.5 farm, and actually it's in desktop, right? It's it's in desktop as well. As well you can install what's called the Mobility Pack. What the Mobility Pack does is it expands the architecture, and there's two new virtual channels added to the stack here. You have a mobile receiver virtual channel, and then you have the location virtual channel. Now the location virtual channel is going to pick up things like the GPS on your mobile device, and the reason these things are separated is because maybe you want to have some mobile receiver functionality, meaning you're going to get to your mobile device, but for, for privacy or security, you want to disable the, uh, the location. Now, these virtual channels are controlled by Citrix policies, 
meaning you have a lot of um, flexibility on when these things are on and off. So maybe you want it on if they're outside the network, um, I guess inside the network it doesn't matter too much, or you know, based on uh, endpoint security scans, things like this, you can control when these virtual channels are turned up and turned down. So pretty neat. Also in the mobility pack is a tablet optimized desktop. So again, if you're taking this to a mobile device, especially a small form factor mobile device, hitting the buttons is pretty difficult. But Citrix has put this kind of skin on top of the desktop. And it's really, I mean, it's switchable. You'll, we have a demo, but you see this kind of button at the top. You can switch back and forth between a traditional desktop and the mobile desktop. And it gives you a lot of uh, touch-friendly features and makes it a lot more usable. So here we go on our first demo. All right, so a little bit about the demo environment. What I have here, I have my iPad, and as long as AirPlay works okay, we should be good to go. <laughs> okay, that there we go, too. AirPlay. So what you're seeing is my iPad here, and I'm going to go into receiver, and I'm going to launch a desktop. Fingers crossed this works. Okay, so there's my desktop. And then you see that it realizes I'm on a mobile device. So the, well, let me close server manager here. I actually closed the whole thing, didn't I? Improve your case. Improve my case with my big fat finger. Okay, let's do it this way a little bit better. All right, so here's my mobile device, as you can see here. So the start menu here is a lot more touch friendly. And as you're going through long list of things, a lot more scroller friendly. So your big fat finger won't click on things that you're not really meant to. And the look and feel is a lot more of what you would expect as well on the mobile device. And then the special My Computer button gives you a nice uh, uh, browser for your local machine. Of course, this is executing on the Zenapp server. The Zenapp server is running on my laptop over here. So you're browsing your file system. All of this is in the data center, and all of this is right out of the box. No coding involved. You see I'm switching back and forth. I need to get back to my traditional desktop, no problem. Hit the button, go back to the mobile style desktop. So that's pretty cool. So that's just like an app that runs, right? Jeff? Yeah, it is. It's like an app. I think I'm pretty sure it's layered on top of the desktop. Yeah. And it's free? Yes, it's part of it. Where, where do you load it from? Uh, it's part of the uh, mobility pack, so you just have to get the, for 6.5, you have to get the hotfix for it. Right. Yeah. It's just, you go to uh, citrix.com slash CDN for Citrix Developer Network. On the right-hand side, there'll be a link for the mobility pack. There's, I mean, there's the mobility pack, and then there's a mobility SDK, so there's two different things. So get the mobility pack. That just installs on your Zen app server. And that gives you those policies, it gives you that mobile desktop, all that, totally free. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Did you say that also? <coughs> yes, it was just released at the end of June, the, the same equivalent features for Zen desktop. Um, for, you mean iOS and Android? Yeah, for the receivers, that's right. All right. Yeah, the mobile desktop works on Android. Okay. Anything else? BYOD. BYOD, man. <laughs> that's right. All right, the next cool thing, this is still, we're talking about the mobility pack. The next cool thing that's right in there is, these are, again, policies. The, by the way, the desktop thing, the mobility, our mobile optimized desktop, that's a policy. In the Citrix policies, you turn on and off. Here's a couple of more policies. So again, um, making it feel more native. You have a automatic keyboard pop-up. So you can turn this on. So whenever somebody clicks inside of a text field, the local device's keyboard will pop up. By default, if you don't have this on, then they have to go hit a button to have the keyboard pop up. Or if you're a Citrix receiver, you can do a three finger tap and that will bring up the keyboard for you. But this gives you a little bit more native feel so when you click inside the text box, it realizes that got focused, let me pop the keyboard up for you, and then you can pop it down, do what you want to do. Also, something else that's cool is you can turn on what's called combo box remoting. What that's going to do, whenever you have a combo box, which is just a drop-down list in a Windows app, it will detect that that event happened on the drop-down, 
and then it'll pull up the native picker on the phone. So if you're an Android, it has a little block and it has little circles as you click. Or if you're on iOS, you see it has a little scrolly thing here. So it pulls up the native devices picker. So let's see that demo. All right. Trusty AirPlay again. We're still on. Okay. It didn't show up in there. So I think it'd have to reset it's, each it's time. It's back here. Oh, there it is. Yes, do that. Okay. So this is just a, a character map published application. It's just built into Windows. I was just looking for some app to publish that had a, a drop down. So first of all, we'll do the, the text box at the bottom. As soon as I click inside that, you'll notice the keyboard pops up. It's a native UI field. You know, I do test and all that. If I click the combo box up here, you'll notice that the native picker showed up in place of the Windows combo box. So I can come scroll through here and pick out what I want on that combo box, giving the user a much more native feel than if this was off, then that combo box would drop down and it'd be very small lines and my big finger might miss the selection that I wanted. Um, this doesn't always work. So when I tried to publish this in Microsoft Word, it, not all the combo box um, did the drop down. Um, you had an explanation of why. It's, it's trying to detect, but in some cases it can't figure out the best thing to do. So it's, it's doing the best it can, but you know, sometimes it comes with the keyboard pop-up, it might be too aggressive. You know, it might be popping up when it shouldn't pop up so much. But uh, when it comes to the combo box, it, sometimes it just doesn't see the, some of the, if it's done a different way, it doesn't see it, so it doesn't bring it up. Um, that's a long-winded answer. Your mileage may vary, so it's cool, but if users yell at you because it's not working, um, I'm, call Jeff. Hey. It's the same as the screen screen latency reduction manager 15 years ago. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Damn office. It, it can be better perfected, yeah. but it, w it was actually done by a different group. It, we were at the bottom of the stack, and the, they did stuff at the top, so, yeah. The stuff that Jeff writes is perfect. I, I don't say that. It's not, it's not true. That was a published apps group, right? Published apps? That was a published app. That I yeah, just, did. just normal apps, yeah. 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 So, yeah, works on published apps. Got a question back here. So the question was, do you need to add that keyword mobile to your published app? I'm glad you brought that up. Keywords mobile. The answer is no, you don't. That's a, it's a policy, so you can control whether it's on or off, ba again, based on conditions. But I'm glad you brought up keywords mobile. Thanks. That was good lead-in. So, yeah. yeah. So if you add the, this to the description of a published application, cool stuff happens. Um, what happens whenever you go and you start a published application, it talks to the uh, Zenapp server. XML is brought down to the receiver about that published application so the receiver knows what to do. And then if the receiver sees this in the description of the published application, all this extra cool stuff happens to make your mobile life a little bit more bearable. So I'm not going to read to you. You can read some of that, but you know, it makes um, the experience better. So by, by and large, I do this on pretty much all my apps. Um, because if it's not mobile, it won't do anything. If it is mobile, people will like you better. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on mobility pack stuff? If not, we're getting into code. We got a question right here. Yes. All right, so the question's like, if I'm doing this keywords mobile, do I have to do like an app published for a desktop and an app published for a mobile device? Is that the question? Yeah. And the answer is no. You can do one published app. If this is interpreted by a desktop app, it just ignores it and doesn't do anything. It just launches as normal. Okay. Yes, sir? Do you have an opinion on how much further you think this can go in terms of the mobility pack? Are there a lot more features that can be done, or is this just sort of a limited basis that it can handle? So do I have an opinion on how much farther this can go? Yeah, I've got a lot of opinions on how much farther it can go. A lot of it is going farther into what we're about to talk about in the coding methods, though where you're giving some developers more power on 
what they're doing. As far as there's a ton of stuff that could be done to make the mobile experience better with no coding methods out of the box. This is what we have available today. Yes, sir. Um, to, to, to be clear on the keyword mobile, I mean enabled. So if you have the keyword mobile in your description or whatever, uh, it's only if you have a touch based client that it enables these things. If you can't include the client that has a regular traditional keyboard and mouse, then it won't add, it, it doesn't add any of those extra functionality. All right, so the, the, I guess it's more of a statement or oh, a I'm question. Oh, okay, okay, the question. Yeah, all right, so if you add this keywords mobile to the description of your published application and you launch it with a Windows client or a Mac client, that's ignored and nothing happens. So, that's what I said. so you can add it to all your apps. Right, you can, that, I do. I add, it, I add this keywords mobile to all my apps. And so what happens is that keywords mobile is interpreted by the mobile receiver. If the mobile receiver sees this, it, makes, it does some of the adjustments for you. And which one's the mobile receiver? So iOS and Android? iOS and Android. iOS and Android are the mobile receivers. Right. Do you need to have the mobility pack installed? Do you need to have the mobility pack installed um, on just the keywords mobile? I don't think so. Uh, the, the receivers would be the one that are intelligent about it, so they would see it. No, right. you wouldn't need the pack, but you, you kind of need it to use it. So you know, this doesn't yeah. mean a lot if you don't use it or but something. For what it's doing, like the session size to make sure it's the, the right size and setting the drag mode on, this is all receiver stuff that you could go do on the receiver yourself. I'm 99.9% .9 positive you don't need the mobility pack. So just in case I'm wrong, then there's that 1.1%. But yeah, because the receiver is the one that interprets that, that keyword's mobile, and it, the receiver makes adjustments for itself. Yes, sir? So the question is, the keywords mobile, do they function through the web interface UI? Um, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to defer to Jeff. I'm pretty sure that's right, yes. You're getting an ICA, well actually the receiver is getting uh, the, the same, whether it's coming through the mobile receiver or if you go web interface, it's getting, the receiver is getting something to launch. And now what it launches, it's really just a text file, so it has like, if you're doing secure gateway, it has that, or if, you know, the application name and all that stuff, the description's coming down with it. So it, the receiver interprets that. Yes, sir. Um, you said you needed the 6.5 uh, for mobility pack, right? Right. Um, what about the Zen desktop? Is it also 5.6? So it's, it's Zen desktop. It's 5.6 FR1, which was so, released at the end of June. So to do mobility on Zen desktop, Zen desktop 5.6 uh, FR1. Pack, feature release one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Yes, ma'am. You put that exactly. Hmm? No. Um, I'm almost positive it's the S. I pulled. I think you're right. I'm Keywords. Very, I'm mobile. very sure. I'm almost right. positive it's the it's S. It's documented on the web. Uh, yeah, it is documented on the web. Um, if you go to citrix.com slash CDN again, and there is the Citrix mobi mobile SDK, not the mobility pack, the mobile SDK, you click that, there's a document link, and then I pulled, I mean, this bullet point list I pulled from the website. I'm almost positive it's keywords. Uh, you verified? Okay, good, thank you, because I, I did type keywords. I've copied and pasted that text, but I did type, type keywords up there. Okay, any other questions? Okay, you guys ready for code? We're gonna open up <laughs> Visual Studio, and we're gonna open up Xcode, and all kinds of stuff, all right. Okay, so when you're brave enough to say, I'm going to code something, here's the problem. You have different platforms, we're just focused on iOS and Android for now, and you have different development environments and different coding languages. So you have to think about, all right, am I going to do some objective C so I can do iOS? Am I going to do some Java so I can do Android? Um, iOS, you also need a Mac, and you need a, a Apple developer account if you're going to actually create a package that you can then distribute. So, and you know, developer account with Apple is something you pay for. Um, so there's a lot of questions on what are we gonna do as an enterprise, what are we gonna do if we're going to take the plunge and do some coding? Well, that's getting as close to the device as you can get is doing native code. What if you want to do 
remoting display, or I guess not even remoting display, but if you wanted to get not quite native, but you wanted to get closer to the device than just a remoting protocol. Well, first thing, you can do HTML5. HTML5 will get some of the device features, like it will let you get the location of the device. It will, there's some new form elements in HTML5 that gives you a little bit nicer UI, but that's about it right now. There are some hybrid frameworks. The coolest one I've seen is called PhoneGap. Anybody heard of PhoneGap before? Raise a hand. Wow. One, two, to be more. Okay. All right, so, yeah, yeah. Well, I know you have. All right, so PhoneGap is really cool. What, so the, the idea behind PhoneGap is they're thinking, all right, the, the slide I had before where there are all these development environments and IDEs and all that, they're saying, you know, there's not a lot of people that know Java and Objective-C and whatever else that you need. So there are a lot of web developers out there. So what if we could let somebody develop with straight HTML or HTML5 and give them access to the native device? That's what PhoneGap does. It takes away the, the complexity of the Objective-C and all this. So it just lets you do web pages and then access things like accelerometer, camera, compass, contacts, file, geolocation, all this stuff. It lets you access all this stuff on the device, but you don't have to learn the coding language. So if you just know some HTML, you can write native applications for multiple devices. It's pretty cool. So we have a demo of PhoneGap. Okay. So here is what PhoneGap looks like. Uh, that, actually, this is Xcode. This is what Xcode looks like. This is a development environment for Mac. It's, it's kind of hard to see. Let's but you're not doing Mac code. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm with, I thought it was Command Plus to zoom in. Uh, control and then two fingers up and down. Control, thanks. It is not working. It's been able to on the Nah. Oh well. I thought I had earlier it's Command Plus was working, but not now. Um, it's hard to see. Can you guys see that at all? Can you guys see this at all? No? It's uh, probably not. Out, let, let, we'll take just a second to see if I can make this bigger. Can I do a... You believe me. <laughs> it's cool, though. It, it, that, that's a hint uh, to move on. Yeah, that's a hint to move on. OK. <laughs> Well, you'll, you'll see what happens. All right. I'll tell you what it is because I can't see. The, the, at the very top, there's a, a call out to some JavaScript that um, sets up what's called Cordova, which that's what the code name is with this. And then here's the HTML right here. You have the body tag and then the body tag right here. And I'm just putting an image. There's the Bright Forum Chicago image. I'm putting a, a, a text box that says, send, you know, what kind of message do you want to send? A uh, drop down list that says what, how do you want to send it, like text or vibrate or light. Well, light only works on Android, so I, don't, I shouldn't have put that there. And then a button that actually sends a message to your phone. This button says on click right here, run that script up there. So that script right up there is the phone gap stuff. So it's just one function call that will give me a native um, text message on my phone, well, not text message, but a native alert on my phone. So this is what it looks like. Let's go run this guy. Here's my iPhone simulator. Here's my nice bright form Chicago image. Then I want to say FUIT or IT for the win. We'll do text. Done. And, oh, where'd my button go? Did I, did I actually accidentally typed over my button? It looks like, sorry, I got debugging on the fly here. Um, yeah, I accidentally put an equal sign here. See, it's real. It is, <laughs> it is real. We actually are doing stuff here. Now my, my button's there. Um, and then done there, text. and notify. And so what just happened here is all of this HTML 
was wrapped in, is a wrapper, the phone gap is really a wrapper. All this was executing on phone gap, or in basically a viewer inside phone gap. When I called that special JavaScript to send the message, it went outside the wrapper, and the wrapper has access to the, um, to the native device, and says, pop that message up on the native device. So this is pretty cool. This is actually developing um, native um, iOS I mean, code here. So you can put this on the App Store. You can like, once you compile this, this you'll have an IPA um, package that you can actually put on the App Store and charge for people, and people are doing that now. People are developing uh, apps that are on the App Store, charging for them um, on the App Store, getting paid and making money through this. Yes, sir? Wasn't that against like, Apple's terms or something? That to have apps developed in like other frameworks that was was it something like that or no? They, so, they found a way around it. They, they when originally like they were saying you couldn't have Java inside an app to to do other things. You know you're not supposed to make it too generic. But what they're really saying is well, we're just web pages. We're we're just JavaScript, and we're running inside a wrapper. What's so fancy about that? Right. So that's how they got away with it. Yeah, the wrapper is native iOS. So yeah, it's like you have a wrapper that's native to the device, and then you have your web page inside of that. So when the web page said, run that code to send a message, it told the wrapper to do it, and the wrapper went to native code to actually pop that message up. Does that make sense? So this is pretty cool. You're developing native apps with HTML. Now the code base will work on Android and anything else, but keep in mind, this is not a build once, deploy anywhere. If you want this on Android, you have to go pop up an Android development environment. You can use the same code, the HTML stuff that I did in there, but you're developing for different platforms. So you, same code base, you're developing for multiple platforms, and they are native apps to the device at that point. So that's kind of cool, but when you do that, when you're developing for multiple devices, um, it, but you're using the same code base, that's cool, but you have things like, uh-oh, you know, if I need to get access to data, then you're like, all right, well, I need to plug into a, a Dropbox or a share file. I'm going to have to have some secure data access back up to the data center. So we have a data problem at this point. So you got to figure that out as well. But very, uh, very smooth native user experience using PhoneGap. Questions? OK. So the next thing we're going to get into and this is why Jeff is here, is the mobile application SDK from Citrix. Uh, Jeff wrote this thing, so. <laughs> well, I wasn't the only one. You wrote the Android part, right? Um, well, the, so, the server pieces. OK. Yeah. Jeff wrote a good bit of it, so. If you have very, questions, ask him. He's a very modest guy, too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. So what is the mobile application SDK? So it's really a, um, a set of mobility-focused APIs. And it's kind of doing the same thing that PhoneGap is, if you have that same kind of concept. So you think of receiver as the native piece of you know, code that's running on the device. And then your publish application is talking to receiver. And if you want to pop up like a native combo box or you want to do some text messaging just like I did with the PhoneGap, you can tell receiver to do that for you. And then once you, like if you're doing a picker, once you make that selection, it communicates that back up to your, your Zen app or Zen desktop server. So it gives you access to mobility features of your device, but your app is running in a data center, so that solves the data problem too. Because if everything's in the data center, I have access to my backend services, so we don't have the same data problem we do with the hybrid solutions like PhoneGap. Um, one thing to point out that the feature, there's a link for the feature matrix. I'm not plugged in hardline right now, Jeff is. So I, I can't click on the link. But the, there's a matrix of what you can do on which device. Naturally, you can't do some things on iOS that you can with Android, because Android has different buttons in iOS. So you can respond to those different buttons that you press on uh, Android. And then um, you said camera works now, right? Yeah. Like right now? Yeah. OK. Camera didn't work on iOS. It does now. Um, it worked on Android before. So you could take a picture on your mobile device, and it would ship that up to the server in the data center. Uh, it now works on uh, iOS as well. OK, so let's take a look at the mobile application SDK. OK, 
So quick note about my environment here. I'm running a bunch of VMs on my laptop. I have a Windows 8 VM that I have Visual Studio on. <laughs> and I have a Zenap uh, 6.5 server. And I have a domain controller running all this. So what we're going to look at here, I should, hopefully I can zoom in on this. Um, this is a form, looks very familiar to what we just did with PhoneGap. So it's going to do the same thing, except I didn't have the fancy picture in there. So what happens here is we have the text box, a drop down list, and a button to send a notification. Um, let's look at the code behind what's going on. So if you look at, um, any guy, you guys been in Visual Studio before? Raise your hands. Okay, I don't want to get too deep if this yeah, is like the first uh, time you've seen this. Yeah. All right, so this text box, I mean, if you are developing a form, you have this cool toolbox over here that you can just drag like text boxes and combo boxes and all that. And then you have um, some, what's called events over here. So when I'm saying on this text box, whenever I enter the text box, again, I, I need to, can you guys see that or no? Yeah. Okay. Whenever I um, enter the text box, meaning the cursor enters the text box, it has focus. Well, you can't read this, can you? Uh, can you? All right. So what I'm doing, I'm saying, if this is a mobile device, pop up the keyboard. And I'll show you how to figure out if it's a mobile device or not in a minute. And then once you leave the text box, you'll see over here there was another event for leaving the text box. Right there, once I leave the text box, I'm saying, hide the keyboard. So popping up the local device's keyboard and just code is really, really easy. And also, it's worth pointing out that I'm just doing the bare minimum. Right here, you can tell it to do all kind of cool things with the keyboard, like do autocorrect or add certain keys to the keyboard or take away. So that's kind of cool stuff that you can do, too, to control how that keyboard looks. Um, as I said earlier, I was going to show you how I figure out whether this is a mobile device or not. The first thing you do when you're doing a, an app like this is you import a reference to the mobility pack. Then I want to use the uh, namespace Citrix Mobility here. And then you actually try to open a connection to the mobile device once this thing starts. If it works, then you know you're mobile. If it doesn't, then you know you're not. Or at least you are mobile and something bad happened in which this stuff won't work anyway. Okay, so what I'm doing here is this code right here. Right here it says, CMP, that's just a variable I'm using, is new Citrix mobile. Then I try to open a session. And if I was successful, then I'm just setting this variable is mobile is true. So that's throughout the code. Now you know whether you're on a mobile device or not. You can get fancier than that. You can figure out screen resolution to whether it's a tablet, whether it's an, a, a phone, what kind of phone it is, iOS, Android, things like that. You can start interrogating that advice. OK. So also, what I'm doing over here is on this picker, I set some very, mean some items that it could be. Again, light, vibrate, audio, text. And then on the event on that, I'm saying whenever you see this event, uh, this picker drop down, or this combo box drop down, go run some code. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just setting a title for the picker pane, and then I'm just saying, hey, CMP, show the picker on the device. It shows the picker on the device, once, um, and then it sits there and waits for the user to make a selection. Once it does that, it comes over here and runs this code that says whatever they picked before, just make that the default. I mean, that's the choice they made. So, Because what's happening now is the app is running on the server. I just went in and I clicked the drop down, and the app told the receiver, pull up the native device's picker. So that picker is sitting there waiting. When I click on it, the uh, receiver is going back and telling the app on the server in the data center, here's what I just clicked on. And so then it sets it for you. Then finally, the notify button, if you once you click on that, all it does is, um, I mean, this is how easy it is to notify, it means pop up this notification method. So CMP, notify user, and then there are some variables that you pass to it. One of them is the text in that box that I just uh, wrote. So fingers crossed that. This works now. Mm. OK. Airplay. Mm. 
Okay. So the published app, actually I just named it test. So the published app here, I'll launch that, fingers crossed. Oh, I didn't have my thing up here. You didn't see that, right? <laughs> they were right. Taking oh, notes. well, I'm still running on my, my other app I was running back there. It's kind of hard to see on here, but um, there's my, let me close this app right here. That's my character map I had from earlier, because um, good old, uh, what should we call it? Um, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. But this is from the, uh, I had a disconnected session. And now I'm gonna to have to go back here. So I just reconnected to my disconnected session. Okay. So here's the test thing that I just did. So you'll notice the picker is right there, telling it to do the local picker. I wanna do a text notification. The, um, the text box gets focused, so now I can do here. And then I hit notify, and then the notification is up on the native device. So basically the same thing we just did with PhoneGap, but now I did it with a Windows app that's running in the data center using receiver as the wrapper for that. Now, the thing about that is it solves the data problem because now this app was running from a data center, not locally on the device. But also, a good point that Jeff makes is it solves the issue of the security. Because it is ICA, we know how to securely deliver that protocol. Again, this is just a remoting protocol. We're not delivering the data across the line. We already have things like net scalers and secure gateways, and we know how to deliver applications to uh, ICA clients. And also, um, what was the other point I was going to make about this? Do you remember? Uh, no, I'm not sure which one okay. you're going to say next. <laughs> I don't remember. Oh, yeah, here's the other point. So you, when, uh, when you saw at the beginning where I was doing, um, now, there's no error correction or catching in here. I didn't want to try to get too convoluted with the code. But I was saying, whether, as interrogating the device to see whether it's mobile or not, and actually this gets into the next thing. Um, if you have a, an in-house shop that is developing Windows applications, um, how many of you guys have seen you know, yeah, or run a, have a, an environment where they have an in-house shop developers doing applications for the enterprise? A few, okay. There's a lot of .NET developers out there. So a lot of this you can do with C, C++, uh, .NET framework is what I'm doing, C Sharp. So what's cool about that is you can take an existing application and then you can go and open it up in Visual Studio and do some tests to see if it's mobile. So what we have at that point is what we call responsive design, at least what I call responsive design. Responsive design was originally coined as a web term, meaning as the form factor got smaller, the way the web page was displayed changed. So you can actually design on, you take that, uh, that principle and go to mobile devices as well. So here I have receiver for Mac, and I'm going to launch this thing called responsive demo. And so I'm launching from a full-fledged client here, not a mobile client, at least I hope I am. Yay, okay. So this is a full-fledged client, and this is a Windows application what we're seeing here is there's some edge site data showing us the type of clients that are in use in our environment. And it behaves like we think it would. A Windows client with, you know, has some resizing going on here, all this kind of good stuff. We have these file menus. Um, we want to change the chart type to donut. We can do all this. This is a, think of this as an in-house written application. Now, if I want to take the exact same code and I want to use it on a mobile device, but I want the user experience to be different because this doesn't quite fit the mobile device. What we can do, this is risky because it should pick up on the smooth roaming and change it on the fly. I'm going to connect to, yes, it's, now let me do the airplay. It's an experimental move. This is an experiment, this is, yeah. All right, let's see, we got airplay over here. Okay. We should connect to that session and everything be just as it was on the mobile device. So here I go connecting to the responsive design app. Oh. There we go. So we're still on the donut, but you'll notice now I'm just seeing the chart. The, all the Chrome of the window is gone. The file menu is gone at the top. 
the table is gone below. Now, if because I am mobile, if I click on the chart itself, it pulls up native picker, and I say I want to go back to, oh no. I, I told you it's experimental. <laughs> okay. It's real, it's a demo. Yeah, it proves it's real. Proves it's real. Okay. No guarantees. Okay, so clicking on the chart itself, you know, I can do different types of graphs. And now what's cool is because I'm on a mobile device, I want to take orientation and change it. The app that's running on the Zen app server that has no clue about orientation just responded to my app here. So now I'm looking at the table, now I want to change it back, I'm back to my chart. So this app is running on a Zen app server on my laptop responding to orientation and then also responding that this is a mobile device. It's the same exact application that I launched from my Mac that gave me the file menu and they had the dual pane and all that kind of stuff. So there you go. You can take existing applications, put in some features that will make it mobile. When, when you say it's the same exact app, mm -hmm. is it like compiled down to the same DXE? Yes. Yes. For both, for both? Yes. Yeah, so just to show you there was no magic going on there. Um, well, there was magic, but no trickery on the published app itself. <laughs> you can, it's not trickery if it crashes, right? Yeah, it's not trickery. So this is the published app. You'll notice there's, I don't know if you guys can see that in the back, but there's only one published app called Responsive Demo, and you'll see the EXE right there is the same um, for either way. So same executable responds differently on a mobile device than it does on a Windows client. You could take this farther, and say, have, here's a full client run this way, or tablet run this way, or phone run this way, because once you interrogate the device, the device, it will tell you what kind of device it is and the capabilities of that device and the, the uh, screen size and the resolution and all that kind of good stuff. Um, okay. That is that demo. Are people actually using this now? Like, it seems like this is a lot of work. Or is it a lot of work? Like, if you're... If you have an app already, it's, you know, Windows ready to go, does it take a long time to add these instructions to it to figure out the difference? Or? Surprisingly, no. Um, we've had people convert apps first stage, like in four weeks, five weeks. Um, it makes sense once you think about it. This, this code isn't a lot. It's just enabling features that Windows doesn't have. So if you take your standard Windows app, add a few APIs, all of a sudden you can do things you couldn't do before. Yeah. I guess we already It's not like you're doing all this work for, because it seems like you're sort of like you're locked into using Citrix with this, but I guess at this point you're already committed to them. Yeah, I think it's, Citrix is, is, is it realizes mobility is a big deal, obviously, and this is a step in the direction of fully embracing what we can. Um, another message I'd give out right now that hasn't been said a lot is, um, this is the first time that Citrix has asked developers to change code to better run on a platform. And that's something they've, they've thought about in the past and a long time ago, but then they thought, you know, who would listen to us? But now we need to do it to really target this market. You need to do something. You can't have a Windows app automatically turn into a mobile app. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah. yeah. And also, to your point about um, having developers go through it's really easy to figure out whether you're on a mobile device and you could just do that and that's really not going to change your code much and incrementally change things. So if I want this one field to do something, you can do that or start getting as fancy as you want. So you can do very incremental changes. Um, we already did the responsive demo thing. Hey, Jason, uh, I was yes. an MD and one of the customers walked up to me to use the insurance company. So what was more important to them was not changing their business logic and only changing their presentation logic. So mostly if their app was like well written, and their app was, and say they had a business logic which was separate, and then the presentation logic which was separate. Mm -hmm. So developers were able to change the presentation logic without changing any code, which could change their business stuff. So I mean, their, their main concern were if we go mobile, native mobile apps, which they want to in future, maybe two or three years later, but converting all that business logic on a mobile app or like HTML5 was taking more time on their own apps versus like a stop cap, it was the nice thing to do. Just yeah. change the presentation UI and it was working out. Yeah, so what Michelle is saying, I mean, I've, I'm under the opinion that applications and desktops don't matter as much as data. Um, as long, I mean, the app is just a presentation for data in the end. So in a service-oriented architecture, 
but you have N tiers and you have business and logic as one of those tiers and the presentation of it is different. You can have multiple presentations of the same thing. So mobile, web, full client, so on. So this is a nice way to get at the data as well. Presentation logic, yeah. Okay, other questions? Another important point related to this is that uh, if you decide to go embrace um, native code with uh, iOS or Android or, or if you decide to do hybrid apps or you decide to do web, the cost of porting your business apps is going to be huge. So this is really like a way of getting into that world without having to you know, fully invest mm -hmm. you know, with a new development team or whatever. Right. Okay. Um, also, and here's some other kind of uh, real world stuff. You guys have heard of Control-Alt-Delete Consultancy, Warman Simonson? So, he wrote this thing. This is one of the asks that he had of one of his clients. And this is a QR code reader. So this is a, an app that's running on the Zen app server and using the picture capabilities of the phone to go scan the QR code that ships it up to the Zen app server and decodes it there. So the cool thing about that is that maybe the decoding is changing and you have a database of different kind of decodes and so that's always up to date on the back end and you're just using the, de uh, the device's camera to go use that, to use the QR code. That's pretty cool, too. Um, another cool. I have a slightly related question. Um, the Zen app world is used to deliver apps. And so the question is really whether application developers are aware of the, that is, the people who develop apps go and do whatever crazy stuff they do. They've yep. done that forever. Are they likely to go along to the Zen app? It's, uh, I think it's a process that's going to take time, like any new thing that comes out. I mean, even when Java first came out, I remember that there was a lot of interest, but there wasn't a lot of development that took years. Right. Fair enough. But uh, I, I think the, I have answers to your questions, but I don't know if you're ready to hear them. Um, <laughs> In Japan right now, they're working on applications based on this SDK. They're already Citrix customers. They're using Zen apps and desktop. Uh, they want to use their mobile devices. They have plenty of that, plenty of bandwidth. Um, so they're very keen to do things that weren't possible before. So it is a real thing, and they really are doing it. But I figure that people that are in Japan are a lot more ahead of the curve of what's going on here. So it'll, it might take a year or two before it catches on here. They have a lot more technology. Um, uh, which technology? Any technology. Phones, internet, cable, broadband, uh, fiber, it doesn't matter. We can talk about it later. No, I know, I, and I'm not, I'm, I don't know exactly where you're coming from, you know, but um, what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, Citrix obviously has not been in this market before. Yeah. Even internally, um, it's hard to convince people that this is an interesting direction to take the company. I yeah. yeah. It's definitely a hard thing because you have to go, what, cause what we're doing, like guys in here, I mean, I'm not a developer by a trade. And most of us, I'm, I would dare to say, are not. So we had to kind of go up the stack over here to cross over to go down the stack over here to developers because developers are going to go and they're going to, like you said, do their thing and they're keeping up, oh, what's the latest on, greatest on, all this kind of cool stuff, and Citrix is not one of them. So how do we get the word out? I mean, stuff like this. Right for them. There you go. Right. Do you have a question? Well, I got a couple of comments to what he's saying. I think um, part of the power of, of what what this can deliver now is is 
for more, perhaps more senior members in the organization who have apps and are looking at the BYOD issue, looking at how do we marry the two, and this is a great way of, of bringing them together, but there are obviously, there's problems with it. I have a workforce of service techs that have um, handhelds, and um, they go down into the bowels of the earth sometimes, they don't have any connection, right. you know, so obviously we've, it's not gonna solve a lot of my problems. Right. Right, but that it's, it could solve other problems, you know. Yeah. But um, the other comment was, uh, Citrix did a, a big event there, I guess, last week. Um, and in Toronto, what they did was they, uh, uh, they, had, uh, they had it coincide with the Batman release. And they did this 20 or 30 minute video. And I talked to some of the Citrix guys there, and they're pretty um, opinionated in the sense that they think that this is going to solve the BYOD problem. That, and I'm just wondering what your comments are on that. They, they think some of this, and I mean, certainly the, the video that they showed when they did their demos, it obviously worked in the video because it was not. But was mine's real. It crashed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But they had a guy running around to a golf course to a, a yeah, 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 yeah. Right. You know, I'm sure other people saw it. You know, it was in 70 countries. Cities mm -hmm. across uh, North America, but what's your opinion of that? You think that you think they're going after the the BYOD with with some of this to try and claim, uh, you know, conquering it? I think what you know the way that Brian summarized it this morning that you know we were so used to plopping down Windows desktops everywhere, and that's just not going to cut it, you know, as far as the future. That Citrix has to take steps to make this better. And a more direct answer is that it's going to take time. To, to solve things like be able, uh, you know, bring your own device. Um, it's going to take a lot of time, I think, to make it perfect. But as long as we're on the right track, it, that doesn't matter because, you know, it, it's not, uh, we have, we're resolving a lot of things as quickly as we can, but there's always going to be something else. Sure. Yeah. Other comments? Citrix is, is leading the way uh, for the enterprise, for the BYOD. I think that, that this is just, you know, something I work for a very large corporation. It's something like this. This is like the number one thing I'm going to take back. Show up and man, hey, you can not launch Word, this and that, but whatever works, you know. We're going to be doing some serious testing because nothing like this has ever been available. We're a big Citrix shop, and every, I mean, we run almost everything through Zenac. And uh, one of the biggest <coughs> challenges has been, you know, when we're launching a desktop on an iPad, and forget about it, you can't do nothing. The fat finger problem. Mm -hmm. And this solves it. It's like, this could be a huge seller. I, I don't see it as perfect, That's but I perfect. do see it as get, you know, pushing others that way. That's right. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. I know my company's you know, got a higher than a small army of mobile app developers, and I'm just like, now we're taking the data out of the data center, where we can just create a mobile app To his point, I mean, the Achilles heel is this is all online. So it's all network based. It's yeah. all network based. Yeah. There are, but the, the, the value, is, sorry, if I can I mean, the, there is enormous value in the fact that you have an app base. The, the change in CPU architecture on the client, for example, means that if you were going to take stuff up and actually do data processing on a client again, you're going to have to install that logic. Right. You have no idea whether it's going to work. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, there are use cases either way. And both ways, I think. Basically, there will be use case. I'll tell you another use case, which probably you will be showing in the future, but there is um, a department of police um, trying it out for a GPS app, so when the traffic cops catch people, they want to take a picture of the display, <coughs> process it, goes into the app somewhere on the back end, and the GPS location is right there on the device. So it's not just the virtual channels, the, you know, all those things can be sometimes really cool. So there are use cases either way when you're online or not. Obviously, there will be mobile apps when they are needed, like Salesforce is doing a mobile app now, it can be cached locally, even like all your Salesforce data on your iPad now these days. So, there are the use cases. There is no one thing which will solve all the problems. There are use cases for this, but if you think that this is good, you know, I'll talk about this tomorrow, and I know Jason and I talked about it last night, but 
put it, and Brian actually said this morning, do you think that VDI, and this isn't VDI, but do you think the mobile app on this, which is still Microsoft, when Microsoft releases Office for this, and they will release Office for this, it's gonna take time, but it'll be there, it becomes different, and if you can't get offline, you call the use case, I have a sales force that works in hospitals. Guess what you have to do in hospitals in a lot of places? Turn off your cell phone, turn off your app. Not everybody does it, but I have sales force all over the world where, heck, I went to Poconos last week. There were places that there just was no data. There's nothing. Why are you working in Poconos? <laughs> <laughs> we have a factory up there. Good comment. But I mean, I, to the point is like, there is no silver bullet. That's right. Yeah. It just doesn't exist. It's a combination of a whole lot of stuff. Okay. You wanna talk about x-rays? Oh, okay. Um, when we first, uh, later last year, we were approached by um, Avanad, I think that's the right. Avanad. Yeah, which is part of Accenture. And they're a, a forward-looking group that looks at developing applications and, and solutions. And in this case, it was for a, uh, a medical uh, application, and they, uh, it probably took them about, I don't know, five or six weeks to, to port something that they already had to run um, with our platform. So hopefully um, I can get it all working. You'll have to switch to the VGA, yeah. I think. Hold on, a second. Where's your VGA port? It should be, I'm not sure, yeah. It's on the back. I like that we can do that now. That bright form switch over VGA. Or I think we can. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Oh no. Um, it's not showing up on the air. Okay. I just have some technical difficulties with showing the uh, the screen. Oops. It's not showing up. Can't do it then. All right. Well, sorry about that. Yep, sorry. It's real stuff. Um, we're almost out of time, so I wanted to skip over to the last slide here, just for the resources. Um, so you hear Brian up here, Brian Cat uh, up here talking. So he has a session tomorrow at 11:40 about you need a mobile strategy too. So he's kind of continued this conversation that we started here. Um, there's Jeff's blog, citrixblogger.org. Um, then I, I put my blog here. I'm trying to I mean, some of the responsive design. That, the app that you saw earlier um, with the whole pie chart and all that, that's open source and free on my website as well. Uh, Warren Simonson, we showed his stuff. He actually, if you know him, he has all these cool free tools. Well, he released all the source to all of his, open, uh, all of his free tools. There's a link right there. You can get the source code for everything he's written that's free. Phone Gap, the stuff that I showed you, there it is, their website. Um, the mobile app SDK docs, where you see the keywords mobile and then the feature matrix and things like that. And then uh, Brian's session tomorrow. And we're almost out of time. Any more questions? Do you want to try to do the thing while we're checking questions? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you brought all this equipment pretty stressful. from Australia. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you have um, VGA out on this? I don't have a VGA uh, out. Okay. Or you can, well, I, I don't know. Other questions while, he try, while we try to get, oh, well, I see your screen, dude. Oh. Magic. Cool. Well, not this screen, though, right? Yeah. Oh, I switched away, that's what happened there. Okay, remember to fill out your, your comment forms. Um, Dave and Buster's tonight. And I hope you know, if we can get this, going, you're welcome to stay for another five minutes. <laughs> <laughs>